Hello everyone, um, welcome back. For our next session, we've got Ina Kostakis, who's a research fellow at the University of Portsmouth. Um, Ina is a research fellow with the Centre for Healthcare Modelling and Informatics at the University of Portsmouth. Her research uses routinely collected clinical data of both medical and surgical patients to study the risk of outcome or deterioration. Current studies include outcomes for patients needing major emergen emergency abdominal surgery, optimum frequency of vital sign observations to pick up patient deterioration, and the performance of early warning scores in COVID-19 patients. Today, she's going to talk to us about the performance of news, news to and compliance with vital sign monitoring during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Ina. Yeah, thank you very much for the intro. Um, I hope you can all see my screen okay. Um, yeah, so I'm Ina Kostakis and I'm a research fellow at the University of Portsmouth and today I want to present the results of um, some analysis of clinical data that we have done earlier this year um, and in particular two bits of work. One looking at the performance of the uh, national early warning score in COVID-19 patients and then a second analysis looking at the compliance with vital sign monitoring of patients on the ward during the pandemic. But before I start my presentation, I'd like to thank my team, in particular Gary Smith, um, for their help in, in putting this together. For those of you who don't know what early warning scores are, there are clinical tools for the to identify patients at risk of deterioration. So there's some sort of um, risk model. They're typically based on um, vital sign observations, and there's actually a large number of different early warning scores out there. Um, I'm aware of over 30 of them. Um, and some of them are designed for specific patient groups, while um, others were designed for specific conditions. But there's one particular one, um, which is called the National Early Warning Score, or NEWS, that has been introduced by the Royal College of Physicians in 2012. And this one is really very broadly applicable and, and, and was designed for adult patients on the general ward. In 2017, there was an update to it called News 2. And because it's so broadly applicable, um, it's actually now widely been used both nationally and internationally. And um, the latest statistics that I heard is that it's actually now used in 100% of UK hospitals um, in some form or shape. Um, because of its wide use, it's, it's actually been validated uh, extensively for a range of clinical conditions, including the detection of sepsis um, and different settings. It's, for example, used uh, by ambulance services, as well as in GP practices in hospitals. So how does news work? Um, as I've already said, it's based on vital sign observations. And here on the left hand side, um, you can see the seven different parameters that are included in news. And so if the healthcare staff go to see a patient and they measure their vital signs, if um, the vital signs are within a normal or an expected range, each of these parameters will be assigned a score zero. And you can see the different ranges here in the center column. Now, if the vital sign measurements are slightly deranged or more severely deranged, um, these individual scores can increase from zero to up to three. And the final um, news value is calculated simply as the sum of all of these individual parameters. Now, the difference between news and news two is, um, or the main difference is, you can see this here in, in row three, is that news two includes an additional um, scale for to measure oxygen um, saturation, and this is intended to be used in patients with, with COPD. All other patients will remain on the, the oxygen, this other oxygen saturation scale, and that means that for the vast majority of patients, it's over 95%, and news and news 2 are actually identical, um, and therefore I won't distinguish between the two um, in this talk. Now, because news Oh, actually, I should say one more thing. And um, the news scale can can range from values of zero for healthy patients to a maximum value of twenty, um, which indicates that a patient is seriously, seriously ill. And so, the gradual with well, a gradual increase in news that indicates a, an increase in risk for this patient. And um, because news can show 
um, kind of the extent at which um, a patient is at risk, it's quite often tied in um, local hospital policy um, that describes how patients and the deterioration of patients on the ward should be managed. And just to give you an example of what that can look like, so for low risk patients um, with a news of zero to two, um, the news and early warning score protocols dictate that their vital signs should be checked after 60 minutes. If the news value increases slightly to a value of three to four, um, this observation, recommended observation interval actually drops to four, uh, to like a four hour observation interval. And then for patients at risk, the, um, the, the period in between observations decreases significantly to either hourly or even observations every 30 minutes. And then for these more high risk patients, um, usually protocol also includes that, for example, um, doctors should be consulted or um, should be called to review the patient. Now, as we all know, earlier this year, the, the COVID pandemic hit the country and it was actually in the middle of March when the NHS wrote to hospitals to tell them to change their, their processes to be able to cope with, with the pandemic. Um, and this included two main points. One was to reduce the number of patients that was in hospital at a given time, and the other was to um, expand critical care capacity. And in the context of the pandemic, News 2 was actually recommended for use in COVID-19 patients by both the Royal College of Physicians as well as the World Health Organization. And NICE has also recommended it for use in, in the community setting. So two obvious study questions arose from, from the situation. One was, what kind of evidence do we have um, using data from our local hospital in Portsmouth um, that um, for the performance of news in patients with COVID-19, because this was a brand new disease, we didn't know a lot about it. Um, you know, it seemed to be really quite dangerous, but um, how well does news work in, in these kind of patients? And then the second one was considering all the changes that hospitals um, went through from redeploying surgeons to medical wards or bringing in, um, for example, retired healthcare staff. How did that change the compliance with vital sign monitoring? So our study was a retrospective cohort study. All data was collected at Portsmouth Hospitals University Trust. And the entire data set included data from the beginning of 2018 to the end of April, 2020. And for each admission, we had patient demographic data, admission and discharge data, vital sign data, as well as PCR test results were available. And as you can see, this resulted in a really very large data set. We had almost 3 million vital sign um, observation sets. And this only includes the observations where data on all seven parameters included in use was available. So we've simply excluded all missing data from, from this analysis. And uh, the data was collected using handheld devices. So it's collected electronically on by, at the bedside by the, by the nursing staff. And they simply enter the, the vital sign measurements into this device. And the system then displays the, the overall news score um, as well as the time when a patient should next be monitored. And our endpoint um, or our outcomes that we looked at were whether a patient either died or had an unplanned ICU admission within 24 hours of an observation. So all analysis was done in R. I am a, a new R user and I started to use it just under a year and a half ago when I switched from doing marine science to doing healthcare science. I started to use the tidyverse right from the start and I have to say I'm a, I'm a really big fan and most of the packages that I use are included in the tidyverse. And with regards to my R skills, they are nothing fancy. Um, I'm pretty much pretty basic script based analysis and then doing some fancy plots. And I just want to show you some of the things that I've done um, in this talk. Um, one of the packages I would like to highlight is the data, data table package because it's really extremely powerful and extremely efficient and fast um, when it comes to filtering large grouped data frames, which is um, something that I had to do quite a lot for this analysis. Now, to um, assess the performance of the new score, we split our data set into five different cohorts. Um, each of them included data, only data collected between the 11th of March to, and the end of April. 
and the 11th of March because that was the first day when we had a confirmed COVID case at Portsmouth hospitals. And then we have cohorts for 2018, 2019, and then the 2020 data set was split into three kind of sub cohorts. The ones including patients with a COVID positive test, the ones with a COVID negative test, and the ones that weren't tested at all because they didn't show any symptoms at the time. There were also a few tests that came back inconclusive, but um, patients with an inconclusive COVID test were excluded from the analysis altogether. So we ended up with 400 COVID positive patients over this six week period. Patients tended to be overall older, they were more male, um, and in line with uh, the literature, they had slightly lower oxygen saturation than average, required supplementary oxygen more often, um, and this was reflected in an overall higher median use volume. And just to illustrate that in a little bit more detail, what you can see here is essentially the histogram um, of observations for each different news value or news values between 0 and 10. And I'm only showing two cohorts here for, for clarity. But as you can see, the red bars, which are the 2019 control cohort, um, that shows a very typical um, profile with you know, the highest number of news observations returned a score of zero, and then it's very quickly trailing off with increasing news. Um, if you compare this to the blue bars, which is the COVID positive cohort, you can see that actually the number of observations for a news up to three was, was fairly consistent. And then even at higher news values here, you can see that the proportion of observations in, in the COVID positive cohort was always the highest, indicating that the patients were overall much sicker as indicated by news. When it comes to the assess, like to assess how well news was able to distinguish between patients that had an outcome and those that didn't have an outcome, um, we used the area under the curve or C statistic. And all I want you to take from, from this graph is really that if you look here at the center point representing the COVID positive cohort, you can see that this was you know, in line with, with the performance uh, in all of the other cohort. And um, actually there was no statistically significant difference between these found. And, and that is really encouraging because it means that the new score that was developed you know, for just general adult patients on the ward and um, seems to perform um, reasonably well, um, even in patients with this very new unfamiliar disease. And um, this plot was made in ggplot and I actually quite like, um, you know, the different shading in the background. And if anybody wants to um, know how this was done, here's some code. I'm not going to talk through it um, to save some time, but um, it will be made available later if anyone wants to use it for inspiration. Because I want to move on to, to the second study question, which was how was monitoring compliance affected by, by the pandemic? And in this case, we have to revise our study cohorts. Um, firstly, because just the number of COVID positive patients wasn't large enough for this kind of analysis to return robust results. But also because it's much more interesting to see how did the system as a whole adopt to or cope, cope with the changes that were made to, to the processes in the hospital. So we came up with three different cohorts, each of which um, included data from the 17th of March till the end of April. And so we revised the start date here to the 17th because um, that was the day when hospitals were instructed to um, adjust to the pandemic. And we have data again from 2018, 2019, and obviously then the 2020 cohort corresponds to, to the pandemic or what we call the COVID era. Um, and just to make sure that there was no nothing you know, that 2020 as such wasn't an outlier. We also included an additional control cohort um, for 2020, spanning the first two and a half months of that year. And as part of this analysis, we looked at, um, for example, what hour of day were the most observations taken? Was there a difference between the weekends and weekdays? Um, as well as did the average time between observations increase, kind of reflecting um, demand or high workload on the work uh, on the healthcare staff and one of the other things we could do is is to compare the time period passed between two observations with what was initially recommended by the system as to you know when a patient should next be monitored based on their news volume 
Uh, and essentially the re results of this analysis can be seen here. So on the x-axis here, you have essentially the categori categorization into like low risk with a news of two to uh, zero to two, medium risk, and then high risk patients. And whether an observation was on time, late or missed is indicated by the color with blue be uh, green being on time, yellow being late and red being missed observations. And if you do all of this for, for each of the four cohorts, you can actually see that the compliance with the monitoring um, schedule was best in 2018. And we actually know why that is, because the hospital had previously run a campaign encouraging um, nursing staff to really stick to the monitoring schedule, and in particular, to encourage observations during the night. And then the effect of this campaign just seems to wear off over 2018 and then the beginning of 2020. But when we get to the COVID era, actually compliance has increased slightly, especially compared to the, to the earlier months of that year. Um, we, our data doesn't provide us any explanation as to why that could be. We can only guess. Could, for example, be that the staff to patient ratio increased or that just everybody was, was worried and alert and, and therefore um, you know, paid more attention to, to the monitoring of patients. And um, yeah, these plots are, are nothing fancy. They're fairly basic GD um, plot plots, but um, I just thought they are a very good way to illustrate how R can be extremely efficient um, and how especially the per package can be used to kind of streamline analysis um, of different cohorts. And I just want to talk through an example of how I created this plot um, here in this next slide. So the per package, for those of you who have never used it, um, allows you to apply a series of function to um, data frames, multiple data frames at the same time, if these are saved within a list. Um, and that is what I've done here up at the top. So e I don't know if you can see my cursor, I hope you can. So each of these four data frames um, includes data from one of the cohorts. And what I've done is I, I kind of store them in this list here and then assign a name to each element of this list. And then using the map function from the per package, um, I apply you know, a few basic functions to each of the elements in, in this or to each of the data frames. And this is represented by the dot X um, here. So in a first instance, I just break down my news observations into the three categories, low, medium, and high risk. And then in the next step, I classify observations as on time, late, and missed. And I've done that using, using the case when function that I've only discovered fairly recently. Um, and I absolutely love it because it saves me from using, you know, nested if else statements. And then in the next step, I simply just count the number of observations in each of the categories and calculate some proportions. And then for the plotting bit, I use the IMAP function because that allows me not only to um, apply the functions to each of the data frames stored in the list, still represented by dot x, but it automatically provides me with a second argument, dot y, that is the name assigned to that list element. And in this case, I've used that to create the titles for each of the panel plots. But this is equally useful when, for example, generating tables and you want to automatically generate um, column heading, headings or, or similar. Lastly, I simply um, arrange the four plots that I've created in a two by two grid using GG arrange, and, and then I've saved it all. Um, as a JPEG, and just as a reminder, that's what the result looks like. Ina, you've, you've got five, got five minutes. minutes. Excellent. I was really worried about time, and I think I've been speaking really quickly, um, because I'm already at my summary. Um, so just to summarize, and I want to quote one of my colleagues here, who said, everything changes when the COVID pandemic hit the country, but actually nothing changes. And what um, he meant was that... Um, you know, COVID-19, it was such a new unknown disease. We really didn't know much about it. But then using the well-established early warn national early warning score um, to detect the risk of patients deteriorating actually worked really, really well, just emphasizing how robust these scores are because they rely on, you know, human um, physiology and that doesn't really change. Um, so we could provide evidence that 
that news performed similar in patients with and without COVID-19, indicating that no adjustment was needed to the new score. We, there's no need to develop a new early warning score specifically for COVID-19. We don't even have to change how the cool variants or the parameters included in news uh, or change the weighting um, for, you know, for the different parameters that are included. And similarly, despite the really quite significant changes to healthcare processes and staffing levels, or, or let's say the staffing mix, um, there was really no negative effect on, on the compliance with, with patient monitoring. And just a quick, um, yeah, just to quickly highlight that both of the different analyses um, will be published. As a matter of fact, one of them has only been accepted for publication yesterday, which is why I can't provide a link for uh, to the paper here. But if you have, you know, if you're interested or want to know more of the details, um, feel free to check them out. And I'm obviously also here to answer question now or get me on Twitter, send me an email. I'm happy to to explain some of the details of what we've done and why. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We have got some questions in, so I will just quickly run through those. Um, the first one is, did you check the missing data for bias? Um, different services, patient type, different outcomes. Yes, we did. And there was no obvious um, difference between the different courts, like the ones that had data and the ones that didn't have any data or had missing values. So we were very confident that what we, the data set that we actually worked on was representative of the entire population. And also, I don't remember exactly, but there were really only a, a very, very small percentage of patients that didn't have any uh, complete vital sign sets. Thank you. Our second question is, have you or do you plan to repeat this analysis, particularly news distribution for cohorts post April 2020? to support the feeling that second wave admissions cohort post-September were different to the first wave? Uh, yes, certainly. So um, we were actually, I think we will probably repeat it several times because, you know, um, we always, we wait a few months hoping that we get more data and more data will provide us with more robust evidence. Um, and I think we're, we're about to get a new data set from the hospital. Unfortunately, that will, you know, that will kind of cut off just before the second wave kicked off. So we'll do this bit of an, like one repetition now, and then we're hoping to maybe do the same thing again um, at the end of the winter or in spring next year and kind of include, you know, significantly increase the number of patients. Um, and then, yeah, we'll look at the differences. So certainly that's, that's a plan. Thank you very much. And the last question is from Mohammed. He's, um, the research, this research team has done lots with electronic news data. Would you consider uploading a synthetic data onto the NHSR data sets, please, so that other people can have a play? Um, I will speak to my colleagues um, and the data managers at the hospital and just see um, yeah, what we can do. I'm, I'm sure we can, we can come up with a, with a dummy data set for people to, to get their hands on. And we are running a very, just before we jump off, we are running a quick poll with our listeners to just ask them whether electronic news data analysis is re relevant to your work and it's certainly coming back as yes a massive thank you Ina that was a fantastic talk you've got lots of love in the chat and people have really enjoyed it so thank you and I will see everybody at the next session <laughs>